trap. What does it look like? Duct tape. It is duct tape. Now, back in my old youth group, yes, there were kids in my life before y'all. Back in my old youth group, we had, um, yes, we had uh, a youth group night one night, and I was playing in the band with Zach, who's my brother-in-law, who is really awesome. And I didn't have a guitar strap. And I was like, dude, I don't have a guitar strap. And he's like, oh. And he's like, oh, I got an idea. And he rolls me. He runs, he grabs rolls that So we're stretched over this pool table. And he stretches out one length of duct tape about, right, he's kind of eyeballing it, right? And then he stretched out another length, and we laid it down on top of it perfectly, exactly perfectly. So it's, it's, it's two strips of duct tape, sticky to sticky. And then we reinforce the ends here, and we cut some slits. And I've had this for years. So that's the story. The what? I, I heard something that I didn't hear. <laughs> the old youth group had a pool table. Because you guys just aren't cool enough. Ah! That's not. Okay. <laughs> That's what happened when you're sick. Like last week, if you weren't here. 
here. And you, I, uh, oh, and you overread. Read ahead. Always read ahead. That's good. All right, all right, all right. Exactly. The rash vow. Saul almost ended up killing his own son, and the army stepped in and said, "No, you're not going to do that." So now we come to chapter 15, verse one. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over the people of Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Okay. You remember two chapters ago, Saul was initially rejected by God when he did what? Disobeyed. Yeah, he disobeyed. Remember what, he, what was he supposed to do? He did what Samuel did by himself. Yes, and he gave it himself. And Samuel said, The Lord's going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to another. Well, now Samuel's saying, Hey, remember, I anointed you king over Israel. Now, hear the words of the Lord. It's almost like he's saying this. Okay, the kingdom's being taken away from you, but you're still king, and you've got a job to do. And here's what God says, verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now, go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. That strike anyone as odd. Who is God telling him to kill? List it. List it. Okay. Everyone and cow and everything and sheep. Now, how many people in here think God is love? Okay. Why in the world would God order the destruction? Infants, women, and innocent cattle that can't even do right well. Just think about it. Is this a question? No. Are you trying to answer the question I just asked? Yeah. Well, think about it. I'm not asking the answer, I'm asking you to think. What do you got? Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Think I about have it. another thing. Think, no, just think about it. I want that in your mind, okay? This is God telling Saul to take an army and go kill everyone the women, the children, the infants, everything that breeds in Amalek. Why would he do this? Okay, well. I'll have to wait. <laughs> All right. The, Amalek, the Amalekites were descended from Esau. And in Exodus chapter 17, when Moses was leading the people out of Egypt, you guys remember that whole story? Moses led them through the wilderness. They were attacked at one point by the Amalekites. And in that, that's the famous battle. You guys remember the famous battle where Moses had to hold up his arms, and if he held up his arms, Israel would be winning the battle, but if he lowered his arms, Israel would be dying and losing the battle. And then it, it took two men on each side of Moses to hold up his arms so that Israel would win the battle. Remember that story? You can read about it in, in Exodus chapter 17. This is that battle. The Amalekites were the enemies during that battle, okay? They came out and they attacked Israel, and God said in Exodus 17... God said, I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. What does blot out mean? Kill. 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 Destroy. Blot out. Not just that. He's going to blot out the memory. He wants them wiped out. The point of this is this. You don't mess with God's people. And that's what they did. And hundreds of years later, Saul's in, in, in uh, yeah, the king of Israel, and God's like, it's time to make good of my promise. Hey, does God keep his promise? Yeah. Absolutely. God's like, it's time to make good of my promise. So it's part of prophecy. It's one of the reasons why God is like, we're going to kill them all. We're going to blot them out, just like I said, Matthew. I was just going to block them out. Isn't that like, my blocks, like he blocks them out from the book of life? I don't know if it's the same language. Uh, I have to look into that. But good question. So verse 4. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them into Lamb. How many? How many? Two hundred. Two hundred thousand. You're right the first time. Yeah, she's like questioning herself. Like, did I hear it right? Yeah, yeah. Two hundred thousand. You're right. Two hundred. Two hundred ten. Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand men on foot. And ten thousand. Okay, whatever. Two hundred ten thousand men. Now, now, let me ask you something. How many men did he have with him last time? Six hundred. Okay, so I, I was like sitting here reading this. Where did these men come from? He had 600 men with the last, I've got 210, that, that's you, by the way, this is 600? And that's like 200,000, okay, so I'm like, where in the, I don't have an answer, 
I, I think maybe that these, either these men couldn't get to Saul last chapter when he was just him and the 600 men. Maybe this is years later and he's built up his army. I don't know what the answer is. I looked at the answer. I couldn't find one. But now he's got 210,000 men. Okay, verse 5. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Okay, the Kenites were friendly to Egypt, just like Paul said, just like Saul said, they were friendly. Um, in fact, Moses' father-in-law was a Kenite. So there's even some kinship there going on. And Saul spared them, which was good. They had no beef. God didn't say destroy the Kenites. So this was a good thing. Verse 7. <laughs> and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Hevala, Havila, as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. What happened? So they kept the people. They didn't listen fully. They didn't listen fully. What did you get your hand up for? Um, you like it? It's like stretch. No. Stretch. Um, like, maybe God just like zapped all these people down. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Did they obey? No. Kind of. Who did they keep alive? The good. The good looking women. Women, children, and those animals yeah. were. And yeah. What they Actually, were. interestingly enough, they destroyed all the people except the women. Agag, the king, destroyed oh. everybody. Because like, he had no problem killing infants, but when it came to the king, Agag, like, yeah, leave him alive. That's kind of weird. But he kept him alive. He, and they killed all the livestock. No. No. All but the best. They saved the best. Okay. Sorry, I missed it. I only have two ears. And there's 12 voices. So, yeah. Yes, and my voice is the loudest of the 12. Well, I'm not denying that, but we're going to go to verse 10. No, the, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Verse 11. I regret that I have made... Uh, uh, bring it back. Verse 11. This is God talking to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night, and Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. What did he do? Set up a monument for himself. Saul set up a monument. Okay, is that... Because that just are kind of idols, in a sense. They can kind of be, but I mean, it's, it's almost like he's worshiping himself. He's like, hey, set up a monument to myself because I did such a great thing here. Okay? You didn't do anything. Ooh, great. All right, verse, right, back to verse, verse 14. And Samuel said, wait, wait, verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now, you guys remember a couple of weeks ago when he did the um, when he did the altar and he, he did a sacrifice and he wasn't supposed to, and it says as soon as he was done doing the sacrifice, Samuel was coming, and Saul was like greeting him like, Hey, Samuel! Oh hey, Sam, you remember that? Yeah. I get the same feeling here. Saul's got the best of the livestock that he was supposed to kill. He's got King Agag alive. He looks up, and there Samuel's like, oh, hey, blessed be you in the name of the Lord. Yes, I did all that God commanded me. Verse 14. And Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen? You did, you did the command of the Lord. You, you, you obeyed fully? Like, what, what's all this livestock, man? What gives? Verse 14. And Samuel, and uh, 15. And Saul said, they, what are you talking about? They. The soldiers. The soldiers. Notice that. They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. Verse 16. Then Samuel said to Saul, what did he say? Stop! Stop! Okay, I, I think that kind of struck me as funny because it's almost like Samuel is just, or Saul is just, you know, trying to talk himself out of it. They brought them out of, you know, these people, 
you know, you can't reason with them. They brought them out, the Amalekites. We, we did the, you know, the bad livestock, the dirty ones, the nasty ones, the old. We just voted them destruction. But we kept the good ones. They kept the good ones. You know, the people, they're hard to reason with. Stop! It's, what, it's like Samuel is like at his wit's end. I, I just kind of sense that in him. He's like, stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak, verse 17. And Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go to vote for destruction of the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Verse 20. Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission in which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and I have devoted to destruction of the Amalekites. Argument. Going back and forth. I, I can just see it. From the point where Samuel screams, stop. They're just like arguing. Back and forth. Verse 21. But the people took the spoil. It's their fault. It's not my fault. They took the spoil, the sheep, the oxen, and the best things devoted, and the best and other things they devoted to destruction, the other things. And to these things they sacrificed to the Lord your God and your God. Then Samuel says our key verse, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Better is to obey than to sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. Here's verse 23, listen. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry, because you rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. A key verse, to obey is better than sacrifice. Does God want the sacrifice of animals more than he wants us to obey and listen to it? No. Does God want the sacrifice of animals today at all? No. Does God want religious ceremonies more than he wants us to obey. No. In other words, <coughs> would God rather have us go to church and look the part but do things our way during the week? No. Or would he rather have us listen and obey? Listen, okay. listen and obey. Now, should we go to church? Yeah. 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 Absolutely, we should go to church. But our lives should be listening and obeying him and we shouldn't be doing one thing on Sunday and our own thing that's exactly what Saul is doing. He's taken the commandments of the Lord, and he's doing his own thing with them. And then he says in verse 23, rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Okay, rebellion and presumption, they mean rejecting the Lord. It basically means disobedience. Divination, do you know what divination is? No. It's basically witchcraft. And idolatry is idol worship. So get what God is saying. Disobedience is just as bad as witchcraft. Now in the eyes of God, now look at me. In the eyes of God, our disobedience is just as bad as witchcraft. We don't think that way as human beings. We kind of put sins in categories. We have, you know, lie. lie. Okay, you shouldn't lie, but that's not as bad as murder. Yeah, it is. You know, and, and murder is not as bad as like. Destroying like whole nations of people. And we have yeah. this list of things and this list of people, list of things. But but all sin is sin to God, and God says that our disobedience is just as bad as witchcraft. Anybody ever disobey? Oh. We're all in that category of sinners in the eyes of God. Oh yeah. Remember how Saul treated God like a genie in a bottle? Remember we talked about that a couple weeks ago, that Saul treats God like a genie in a bottle. You know, if I just do my sacrifices, if I just do my religious responsibilities, that'll please God and I can do whatever I want. <laughs> is that how God works? No. no. No, guys, God is not stupid. People aren't even that stupid. You can't, like, well, you can't, like, <laughs> try to be somebody's <laughs> friend. No, like, like, seriously. Seriously, you can smell a fake, can't you? When they're being all nice to you in your face and they're talking bad about you behind your back? Yeah. Are you ever going to trust that person again? No. No. And if we can tell the difference, and we're not going to be fooled by that, God certainly is not going to be fooled by that. Verse 24. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, 
I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. It doesn't seem like his confession of Saul's is genuine at this point. It just seems like he's really more upset that he got caught, not upset that he was wrong. You ever done that before? You ever, you ever got upset because you were caught sinning, but not upset because you sinned? Yeah. I got upset because I got caught on Tumblr. Okay, I want, to, I want you guys to finish the rest of the chapter on your own time. We're running out of time. There's a lot to cover in this chapter. But I want to get to our key verse. Go back to our key verse. Key verse, verse 22. Verse 22. Has the Lord a great deal of burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Better is to obey than to sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. Key question. You can write this down. Where in your life do you disobey God? Think about that. Think about the way that question is worded. It's not where did you disobey, but where in your life do you disobey God? Are we perfect after we come to Christ? No. Do no, we continue perfect. in a life that has sin in it, and we need to work through that, and we need to ask for forgiveness, and we need to pursue holiness? Yeah, absolutely. So think about, in, in your mind, think about where in your life do you disobey God? You can write down our key, key statement. You can probably figure it out, but it's this. If I'm to make Jesus my king, I must be obedient to God's word. If I'm to be king, if I'm to be king, if I'm to make Jesus my king, I must be obedient to God's word. I must be obedient to God's word. You can't claim Jesus as king and then choose to disobey. You can't say Jesus is my king and then live life whatever way you want to live it. You can't bow the knee to King Jesus and King Self at the same time. So if you're here tonight and you want to make Jesus your king, you've got to obey. Does that mean God won't forgive if we mess up? Of course God's going to forgive. But if we live a life thinking in our minds, I can do what I want, God's going to forgive me, it's no big deal. That is not bound to be with King Jesus. That's bound to be with Jesus. All right, we're going to do something we haven't done in a while. We're going to go to breakout. Ladies, ladies, you go with Miss Katie. You can have the couch. 